Um, so thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the difference between operational and strategic agility. Um, just, I was asked when I, as part of the talk to prepare for it is to share stories, a personal story. And to be honest, it's quite difficult. Um, a lot of organizations that we've been dealing with are transforming from you know, the traditional mindset, the traditional waterfall way of thinking to this agile ways of working. And in my experience, I think what we talk about, the promise of agile, I'm not sure I've expo been exposed to that or experienced that. So what I'm going to be doing today is going to be sharing a couple of thoughts and ideas from other people um, and putting into a bit of a concise kind of feedback that you can maybe use with some good tips that you can apply um, after tomorrow. Um, my kind of feeling around these kinds of things is I'm not sure if like these massively new things that are invented every day, but a different way to package it and to actually describe um, some of these concepts. So um, a little bit of a tip, all right? How to make things sound more important, okay? So what you do is you put the word strategic in front of a lot of words. Have you ever done that? So if you want people to attend your meetings, right? What do you do? You put the word strategic meetings in front of it. Sounds more important, right? We talk about workshops, right? We have strategic workshops, all right? And you get the picture. We've got marketing, we do strategic marketing, and we talk about planning. No, we're, more important, we're gonna do strategic planning. This is not, it's a bit of a tongue in cheek, right? And obviously we talk about strategic agenda. Um, so Evan already spoke about one of the tenets of the, business, uh, the domains of business agility being strategic agility. And um, I wanna downplay the importance of it because I think, again, based on what my title is, the achieving the promise of agile, this is what we need to think about. So what do you, how do we define this, right? So um, work by Clayton Christensen, if anybody familiar with Clayton Christensen? I think he passed away um, two weeks ago on the 23rd of uh, January, unfortunately. And he wrote a book called The Blue Ocean Strategy. And he defines what they call market creating innovation in the blue oceans. So on the left hand side, we've got operational agility, making existing products better, faster, cheaper for our existing customers. That's all good and well, right? But the problem with that kind of space is that there's lots of entrants in the market, um, not a lot of differentiation. So how do you actually make you know, good money, good profit? How do you grow in that space? Versus on the right-hand side, which is strategic agility, we talks about how do we create new markets, new products, and new customers, what they call market-creating innovation. That's what the blue oceans is, right? And the ability for growth is massive in that space because the market's not that saturated. Um, there's a... There's a you need help? You sort it. Thanks. He's helping me. Um, so the, the market is saturated. Okay, there you go. It's not saturated, and there's lots of opportunities for, gro for growth in that space, right? But the reality is you do need the left-hand side. You need the operational agility to enable the right-hand side. Right, so if you think about on the left-hand, we've got the, the, the candle. We invented the light bulb, right? We talk about the horses. We talk about the cars. You know, we talk about the Nokia phones and we talk about the iPhones, or we've got DVDs and we've got Netflix. So think about that kind of, that kind of thinking in strategic agility. So we talk about the different industries um, and what, what, what the industries have been disrupted. So if you think about telecommunications, um, there's a couple of people from Vodacom over here, and knowing that their market, their industry has been challenged, right? Because you think about the competition commission reducing your data prices. So they've got to think about different ways and different markets and different clients or customers to be able to uh, offer new services. So that's why you think about content, you know, focusing on content instead of just data and voice. You're thinking about uh, autom automakers, right? From an automaker's point of view, yes, they're manufacturing vehicles. Um, but what about the future? If you think about self-driving cars, you th think about what Tesla is doing at the moment as far as their market share in, in, in the world and what they're trying to achieve is in primarily a software-driven business. And then we already, Graham Codrington this morning spoke about uh, healthcare and some of the phenomenal things that, that are going to be happening as far as your watches, the internet of things, and the sensors that will preempt you needing to go to the doctor. Um, and hopefully, as, we, as, as he mentioned today, uh, we'll pay the doctors based on how many days we don't go to, to the doctor, right? So think about that as far as disruption is concerned. So we move on. This is one of the challenges that I believe, again, my perspective, is that we go and do this massive strategy development. Um, so executives get in a boardroom, they understand the vision, the mission, they obviously get people in to facilitate. Um, we have a great strategic intent and goals. Now, to be honest, 
a lot of the organizations that I've been exposed to in the last eight, nine years adopting Agile Ways of Working, those strategic themes are more or less the same. We talk about we want to be more customer centric, we want to be more digital, we want to be more agile, we want to reduce our costs. They're more or less the same, right? You, you can probably copy and replicate those things. And then go to market with a value proposition. Um, the products and services that go to market. Sometimes what we do is we build the product and hope they come, right? If we build it, they will come. We need to think about it the other way around. And then at the bottom side of things, this is how we execute. So we've got projects, we've got initiatives that we run, operationally how we do things. And a lot of what we do from an agile consulting and coaching point of view is help them at the bottom. How do we make your delivery better at your team level? But for me, where the biggest gap is, is in this operating model. The space around this, the people, the processes and technology, the capabilities there to be able to drive and enable the execution to deliver on the value proposition to achieve the strategic goals. And for me, that's where the gap is. Now, we've already been exposed, and this is just explain to you a little bit of history as to why we are, we, we, why we are where we are. I've actually taken from the Scaled Agile Framework site. I was like looking for a picture, uh, a couple of uh, uh, slides to explain what I was saying. And um, John Cotter, um, very famous in the, uh, in the change world, uh, he's got a new book called Accelerate. Um, and the book is called Building Strategic Agility for a Faster Moving World. And we were actually talking about it earlier this, this morning with a, uh, a colleague of mine. And saying, you know, we start off like this, right? We start off with a nimble organization, a network of teams. We're very customer centric. But as we're growing, so we're a small business, but as we're growing, as we, 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 there's massive growth, we add more people to the, to the business, um, we start doing this. We introduce processes. We, in, we introduce specialization in skills, um, bureaucracy. And what ends up happening, we've got a massive hierarchy. And over a period of time, guess what happens? The hierarchy actually takes over this network of innovative, creative ways of working. And John Cotter in, is a great video, if you see it, if you don't want to read the book, you can watch the movie on YouTube. He's got a very cool video, six minutes, that talks about this, and says, actually, you just need to rewind a little bit. Go back a few steps and look at this. How do we create a dual operating system between creating speed of innovation to that of efficiency and stability? Now, if you see this, you probably would have been exposed to anybody who's seen the Gartner or understands the Gartner bimodal IT. Okay, so bimodal IT from Gartner research paper says there's what we call two-speed IT. You've got system of record and you've got system of change. Um, and on the system of, of record, that's your legacy stuff. You don't want to introduce too many changes in there. You want to be st stable in that environment, um, not a lot of disruption. But system of change, typically your digital stuff, you know, your channel, your apps, your website. And what lands up happening is organizational structure changes like this. Have you seen this? Now, I know there's some colleagues here that they talk about this uh, digital garage and digital hub and digital fast lane, and they create a separate structure to deal with that. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm an advocate of the biomodal IT, but there's a risk behind it. And the risk behind it is that if you're really innovative and creative in the space, but you have to integrate into the back end of the system, which is slow, guess as fast as what you're going to be, right? You're only as fast as your slowest team, the team member, right? So think about that. Then we overlay this with the domains of business agility. I was exposed to this. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be at the business agility conference like this in Vienna last year, um, and this was expo I was exposed to this. It's a really great reference uh, uh, document. I think it was sent out to everybody in the room. Uh, I spent some time looking at it. I think it's really, really valuable. And what I did was a little before this morning, um, I looked at my sort of gut feel around how we expose. And, we, and as we said this morning, we probably focus a lot on the structural agility um, and understanding that network of teams and the process agility. You know, when we go into organizations, we go, oh, how do you, how, let's introduce Scrum or Safe or Kanban. Those are the, the practices that you need to look at. Maybe we're starting to talk about enterprise agility. If you think about the end-to-end -end value chain, um, how agile HR, how do we fund those kinds of conversations. Um, and customer is starting to have a conversation. So let's hope this works because, hey, I was trying to be agile this morning, excuse the pun, so I took a screenshot of uh, what, what you guys put up um, and compared to what I had. So I was pretty close, right? You can see more or less where we've been focusing on. Um, but the strategic agility is an area which we haven't been because I think that's quite hard to do. It's, the, the, like I said, the promise of agile. So moving, on, moving swiftly along, we talk about an agile operating model and what does it look like. 
Now, underpinning, and you talk about you know, helping with my, uh, my, my colleagues in, in, at IQ, talking about organizational design and organizational development. And obviously, underpinning these things like structure and governance, the people, the culture, the technology that supports it. But actually, you need to think about the culture of innovation, right? Remember, on the, on the right-hand side, we talk about market creating innovation. So how do we create innovation that not, is, isn't just a R&D team or only one team, but how do you embed that as part of the culture of the organization to continue with being innovative? So how important is innovation? And anybody, I see Talia, that's one of her, this is not a great resolution, but this is one of Talia's uh, uh, that was here before, one of her sketches. Um, anybody who's met Kent Beck at all? Kent Beck? He was, I see Daniel at the back there. Um, Kent Beck was in South Africa, I think, 2017. I think he's been twice in South Africa. He spoke at Agile Africa. Kent Beck is one of the founders of, of Agile, uh, or one of the Agile Manifesto signatories, and he's the guy that came up with Extreme Programming, XP. Um, and at the time, he was one of the chief engineers, software developers for Facebook. Um, it was a little bit awkward because we had T-shirts made, and, it, and the T-shirt said, as a Scrum Master, I want a T-shirt so that I can fit in one of the geeks with the geeks. And we gave it to him and he goes, no, I don't want that, thank you, because I'm a geek. So it didn't go down so well, but anyways. So, so introduce what they call the 3X model. Again, just a show of hands, anybody been exposed to the 3X model? Quite a few, okay, well, more than what I thought, okay. So it talks about, in an organization, you've got these three phases where ideas go through, right? So you've got to explore, expand, and extract. That's the 3X, right? In the first phase, we talk about experimentation, all right? So we have many options to solve a problem. Uh, we've got an hypothesis, but we need to come up with different options to solve that same problem. So it's quite unpredictable, you know? This is where the thing of lean startup come in, come in, this build, measure, learn. We're gonna introduce new stuff into the market to be able to um, uh, get feedback very early. This is where the true proper definition of minimal viable product sits. Not what most organizations call MVPs, which mostly is your first version, which couldn't, can't actually fail, right? That's the, that's the reality that we have in organizations. But the challenge comes in is when you've made a decision of which option to go for, how do you scale that? Because now it has to go into the existing processes and existing technology. I mean, I was at a hackathon, um, it was at APSA the one time, and the guys after two days came up with great ideas and great concepts. And the, the, the team that won, I asked them, so how long do you think this is going to take to actually implement and roll out into the market? They said, probably because of our processes between 12 and 18 months. Okay, and that's after two days of coming up with more or less the solution, right? But that's the internal processes and governance. So that's where things you know, become hard, right? And unexpected bottlenecks appear. But when you go through this phase, this is when you exploit. Okay, you, when you're actually trying to get a return on investment as much as possible. For every $1 that you spend, you're expecting $3. Quite a routine. This is where economies of scale matter. Okay. So you're really happy with this process, right, with this kind of thinking. Um, and what he actually said was sometimes organizations need different people at different phases. Okay. So people that, you know, on the left-hand side of, you know, like to be disruptive, like to be creative, versus on the right-hand side, which like processes and like that kind of operational routine um, in place. So think about that from that point of view. But all that thought, I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. So innovation, I've spoken about it. Um, the thing with innovation is you need to be able to experiment. And underpinning the thing of experimentation, I don't, if an experiment say you need a 50-50% chance of success or failure, that's what an experiment is. And unfortunately, in most organizations, I am generalizing. Just remember, most of the clients that I deal with are these large corporates that are trying to transform from the traditional ways to the, to the new ways of working. And um, one of the challenges that they have is that they, they, failure is not an option. You know, they use it as, oh, we want to fail fast. We are introducing agile. We want to fail fast until the first time the team failed. And they get wrapped over the knuckles. And then what happens, right? There goes your psychological safety that you need to think about. The one thing that Stephen Denning did say um, in his book called Age of Agile, sometimes you need to be deliberate behind it. Um, and you need to be able to provide playbooks for a teams, departments, areas to be able to pitch. And I think some organizations are starting to address this. You know? Um, you know, I know of NetBank as an example doing the pitch books. Um, people pitching for, for opportunities and ideas and going through this quick 12-week kind of cycle. So that's pretty cool, right, from an innovation point of view. 
but we need to enable this from the operating model. So innovation has to be un embedded in the culture of the organization. And we need to think about these four areas, structure and governance, technology enablement, people and culture. The first one is quite I interesting, but also you probably know about already, right? So currently we are mainly project matrix organization. Okay? Again, generalizing based on where we are uh, from most of our clients. So what happens in a project matrix organization, you've got your different cost centers, your different business units. You, uh, somebody needs to create a business case. Um, the business case goes through a committee. Uh, once that committee go, gets approval for the funding, um, and that could take anything from three to six months to nine months, whatever, however long that takes. And then what will happen, you allocate a project manager or an executive that will actually drive the delivery of that project. They have to negotiate for each of the cost centers to be able to deliver on that. And then basically the project manager is the coordinator of delivery. Their role is to go and make sure that all the teams, all the people, um, uh, or people call them resources, we call them people, right? Um, and we optimize for busyness, so we got 20% allocation of one person and 50% of another and 30% and we go through this process, which based on delivery of value isn't that valuable, right? So you would have heard and, and part of the structural agility that Evan spoke about this morning is how do you create an, a network of interconnected teams? And my kind of definition of agility isn't necessarily agility of one team, but the agility of the interactions between those teams. And in order to create strategic agility, those interconnected teams need to be able to shift based on what's happening in the market. And it's very difficult to do. So if you think about it, we've got this kind of virtual structure of teams, agile teams, operating to deliver on a value stream. But we're still thinking about the old way of budgeting. Okay? And so uh, for me, um, one of the biggest impediments to achieving the promise of agile is how we fund projects and initiatives. Um, we, I was doing a workshop, and I see Sue in the room here last week, um, and one of, the, one of the delegates asked me, so has anybody been able to achieve the ability to fund value streams? And I couldn't really answer, so I'm actually going to do this test. I'm going to say, in your organizations, do you currently fund value streams based on value streams and not project? Amazing, Evan. Just you, all right? Because uh, I, I, I did use Standard Bank as an example. I think there are elements in which they're trying to do that. What that means is that, for what that means from a funding of value streams, you've got fixed capacity that are mostly stable teams that don't change. So you know that the budget of that team is going to be 100 million rand for the year, using a number, right? And the decentralized decision making changes at which initiatives or which features those teams are going to build. It's a very different way of thinking, very, very difficult to do. Okay, so you can see in this, this audience, it hasn't actually been implemented yet. So um, one of the, I think one of the jokes is when you start naming people as an organizational constraint. So your CFO or your F financial manager becomes the constraint here. So you have to have that conversation behind it. Okay, so how do we overlay this? Um, if anybody familiar with this, this is McKinsey Horizon model. Um, and if you overlay, if you think about how we invest, uh, into initiatives and value streams. If you think about the overlay around the 3x model that we had, this is where you need to start making hard decisions. All right? So stuff that is you know, no longer generating value, you need to start retiring them. That's quite a hard thing to do, especially if you made decisions in massive amounts of money and you're considering what they call sunk costs, money already spent. So it's hard to do that. In this investing and extracting, that's when we talk about this expand phase how are we investing in those value streams? How are we actually trying to extract as much value out of it? On the left-hand side is obviously in your explore. So you need to provide, f provide funding in those areas in order for them to have the opportunity to innovate and create some new ideas. Moving swiftly along. The last one is the board, all right? Um, great idea, Evan. I think the opportunity for the board to, to spend some time in the call center is a great idea, right? Because the challenge with boards is that typically are so far removed from the customer and from what is happening on the ground that their core focus is really around financial returns. It's about increasing shareholder value, right? And that's one of the challenges that they have. And so what they do is they set strategy and direction for the organization. Uh, if it's a listed company, obviously every quarter there's results that need to be presented. And what lands up happening is we make short-term decisions based on what we're trying to do from a shareholder return point of view. Okay, so Stephen Denny talks about four management traps, 
and I'm sure if anybody familiar with these traps have seen it in your organization. So the first one is about shareholder value. The second one is the, the trap of share buybacks, right? We have quarterly results coming back, so what are we going to do? As executive, we're going to buy back some shares, so it looks pretty cool for our investors, and guess what? Okay, our results look a lot better. Or this thing about cost, a cost-oriented econo economics trap, right? So because we're struggling, what do we do? We go through a restructuring process where we share jobs, and that's a reality, as we can see all over the place at the moment in a lot of the industries in South Africa. Look, there are tough economic times. I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate an example. I'm going to tell you a story a little bit later where the culture of the organization was such that they didn't share jobs even in the worst economic times for that organization and how they solved those problems. And the last one is the backward looking strategy. This is my favorite one because this is so relevant to me personally. So every year we have strategic planning sessions and we look at last year and say, oh, we need to grow an X amount of percent, so let's just do more of the same or tweak more one or two things instead of actually thinking about what are the things that are actually going to shift the dial, all right? So think about those traps, and this is the board, what the board needs to consider as far as, as changing their behaviors um, uh, from that point of view. So technology enablement, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, as we know, um, Mark Andreessen in 2011 said, software is eating the, uh, software's eating the world, right? Is that the right thing? Yeah. Um, so everything's about software. You know, there's more lines of code in the Hilux Bucky than there is in the whole of Facebook. I don't know if you know that. Kind of interesting. All the guys with Hilux Buckies. Again, that's pretty cool. Um, so how do we enable delivery, right, through uh, automation? So this is why DevOps is so important. Because if you are offering technology products to market, how do we automate the pipeline? How do we focus on creating what we call microservices, so from monolithic to micro, uh, microservices? There's some really great examples. LinkedIn is a great example of how they changed their architecture from a, from a very leg legacy-based system into microservices. Amazon is also another good example uh, where they use certain patterns like strangler patterns, etc. And now that cloud is in the country, so we've got these data centers in the country, guess what? It's going to leverage us. Uh, it's going to obviously uh, accelerate kind of the ability to put new products and, and, and services into, into the cloud. So that's from a technology. People, it's, it's a following Angie and Talia. It's fantastic because this is what I want, my message that I wanted to talk about. So you'll talk about people um, and you talk about the ability to attract, retain, um, develop the right talent for an agile organization. Um, and that's why Agile HR, I think, is probably the next big thing, to be honest. I know that, um, again, the Business Agility Institute is doing a lot of work around Agile HR, and that seems to be the next kind of focus on how do we look at the people element of it. And for me, to be honest, I think it's all about the incentives, and that drives the behavior that we have. And I already spoke, I mean, I think most of the talks this morning talks about that, right? Incentive drives behavior. And if, you're, if your scorecard measured, guess what? You're going to set what those goals are for the beginning of the year, for the next year, and you know, if your bonus relies on meeting those objectives, you're pretty much not going to change, and you're going to keep on driving that, that kind of view. And something like objectives and key results is a great, great way to focus on that, but it's important, and I think Angie answered the question, that it isn't tied to individual bonuses um, and performance measure, measures. So it's something to consider as far as the people is concerned. So guess what, the slide is probably overused, right? Culture, each strategy, or everything for breakfast, Peter Drucker. And reality is, is about the culture of the organization. But what is culture? How do you actually change the culture? Anton Fati, I think he's sitting somewhere. Uh, there you go, Anton. I'm gonna use the line that you said, the culture of organization is formed by the first two to 300 people in the organization, right? If you think about the DNA of the organizations. And, um, going back, sorry. Um, and if you think about that, right, there's another quote, I don't know who said it, but it says, if you want to change the organization, you need to fire everybody. That's pretty drastic, right? That's not what I'm advocating, please don't get me wrong. What I'm saying, it's kind of hard. If you think about going to organizations that have been around for hundreds of years, so we'll talk about you know, 100 years, 50 years, they've got 40,000 people in the organization, and here we come as agile coaches saying, hey, you need to change the culture of the organization. That's pretty hard to do, okay? So my opinion and perspective is that leaders as custodians of culture, need to be able to enable the space for innovation, create the space for autonomy, transparency. Um, I always say, and the, the, one of the, the things I say, leaders should be like gardeners, right? Um, what do gardeners do? They don't say, hey, grow a plant. 
They create the space and environment for the plant to grow. They ensure that the soil's got the right level of acidity. They ensure that it's fertilized, the right water, it's placed in the right thing. So think about leadership as gardeners of, and ensuring that they develop people. And they need to behave the right way. And the one thing that we have, and I think this came up before, is I spoke about it. Strategy is easy, easy to copy, um, but a, a company's culture isn't. And this is the challenge that we have when we go and visit organizations and we want to be like Spotify. Uh, the challenge that we have is that Spotify says, please don't follow us. Don't copy us. There's actually a couple of people that are going around the, the world talking at conferences from Spotify. It says, please don't follow what we do. It works in our context, all right, um, and not in yours. It's our culture, not yours. So just bear that in mind as far as when you're addressing this ways of working, that you understand the context of the organization that you're working in and address those kinds of needs. There's a, one slide. I, I'm out of, there's no picture here, but um, just a story. Anybody familiar with this? Anybody seen this symbol? Swiss Army knives, right? Um, so let me give you the example about a great culture. So um, Victoronics, a company in Switzerland, in, a, in Arbach, a little town in, in Switzerland, founded by Carl Esner. And his goal, uh, purpose in life, was to try to create employment and jobs in that area. And um, when he formed that organization, I guess you know, they were focusing on creating Swiss Army knives. And that, I think the history is that the, for the last 80 years, even though during, because of economic times, they haven't dismissed anybody. So nobody's lost their job because of economic hardship or what the organization's going through. But it has, wasn't met without its challenges. In 20, 2001, 9-11, right? Um, after 9-11 uh, and that disaster, within a few months, their market share and this, the, the actual sales of Swiss Army knives reduced by 30% within three to four months. Why? Because people stopped giving them as gifts um, because you weren't allowed to take them through at the airport. So it ma massively reduced that. So they took some drastic measures. They stopped hiring. They reduced overtime, so they stopped overtime. They reduced the shift time by 15 minutes, and they encouraged people to take early leave. Then the other thing that they did was they actually uh, uh, found employment for 80 to 90 people within that same region for a period of six to 24 months. And during that period, they, because of that ability, they ex accelerated the investments, if you think about the horizons, into new products. So looked at, looked at watches, at fragrances, as, at luggage, into new markets. So instead of the US, which was their biggest market, Russia, India, and China. So if you think about strategic agility, right? New markets, new, uh, new products, new services to new markets. And that's what they achieved from that point of view. And it's a great quote. It says, Victoronics has survived as it matches its words about cultural values with actions and behaviors, not what's written on the wall. All right. And guess what? Guess what? They're an agile organization, but they don't they call what they do agile. They just are. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.